Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Oh. Good you've had the first page. So, today, the second Sunday um, after Whitson, we've got this gospel of the great feast, the banquet. And uh, the placing of this gospel on this Sunday actually predates the feast of Corpus Christi, which is, of course, the big great banquet because it celebrates the Blessed Sacrament. Um, so, uh, Corpus Christi was 1264. This Mass had already been, bit, been written before then, but it does seem very providential that when it was instituted as a feast, that the following Sunday, this was the Mass that you heard, uh, which reminds people, particularly if they couldn't get to the feast of Corpus Christi, about the importance of the Blessed Sacrament in the life of Catholics. And of course, until very recently, 55 I think, there was an octave of Corpus Christi. So if you've got an old missal, if you're following in an old missal, it might be called the Sunday within the octave of Corpus Christi, which is even more fitting. Now, th this parable <laughs> of the great feast and the blessed sacrament, all the fathers see in it an image of the blessed sacrament and of the Holy Mass and being invited to that. It's also an image of the messianic kingdom. So there's various aspects of that which I could talk about and indeed have over the last 30 years. So I thought, no, this week, to give them a bit of a change, I'll talk about the epistle. So when you look at the epistle, in fact, obviously it's chosen by the church to put the gospel into its context, the context within, well, St. Luke's gospel, where it comes from, and to distinguish it, I think, from the very similar parable, it might be a different parable, um, or it might be St. Matthew's hearing of the parable, and there's only one of them, but at, at any rate, St. Matthew has a, a version of this parable with a, a marriage feast, not just a great feast uh, in his gospel. So to put it in the context of all that, we have the epistle, and that gives us how we see this feast to which... Uh, everyone is invited. And this epistle starts off with a reminder uh, of our Lord that the Christian life is not an easy one. Well, there, that was a surprise, eh? Um, I suppose we know that. We know about the constant battle against temptation and the difficulty involved in the means to acquire the supernatural help we need in that battle. It also involves keeping the commandments. It requires a constant and devoted prayer life, and that amongst all our temporal duties, which is also going to do. It requires necessarily mortification of the senses and the appetites, which our human nature does not like and resists. Well, you, you hear that and you think, oh, that's very nice. Uh, you look at that life and you see that it is the life of a hero. Who doesn't want to be a hero? There's a certain nobility in striving for this sort of self-control and generosity. Some people might be lazy, but I think everyone can see that these are admirable ideals. But there is an added difficulty if we do this, if we overcome our laziness and pass from death to life, says St. John, pass from death to life, the world will hate us. And our Lord says we should not be the least bit surprised at that. 
Will the world hate us out of jealousy because we're better than them? Or rage? But some people show that you actually can live a Christian life. You can follow Christ, even in the modern world. You can do it, it is possible. And therefore that would be a reproach to them for not doing it. Because how often do they say, oh no, you can't live like that nowadays. It's impossible. Well, that people are living that life is a constant reproach to them for that. Well, those might be the reasons but I think it's much more fundamental than that. Our Lord's words are, wonder not if the world hates you. And it's the verb hate that is significant because hatred is the default setting of the world. As a sin, it is intrinsically and radically evil. And if we, in fact, love the brethren, there seems to be no possible justification for hatred. Why would you hate good people? Why would anyone hate good people? Now, I wonder though, sometimes you speak to non-believers and that's, <laughs> that's um, not often what they say. Their chief accusation is rarely one of virtue. It is precisely the lack thereof in those who profess to be Catholics. It is a charge of hypocrisy. So we know from our Lord's teaching that he said, love your enemies. There, there's a funny thing. Hatred on the one hand, and then the rule of the gospel is love. The absolute opposite of it. Love your enemies, he said. And then he goes on to say, if you do not forgive them, your heavenly Father will not forgive you your transgressions either. And today, St. John says, he that loveth not abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And, and there's the rub. <laughs> we must love our neighbour. We must even go so far as to love our enemies. And the world cannot understand this. The world thinks it's completely yampy. What a strange way to go on. And their default setting is, as I say, hatred. So who is my neighbour and who is my enemy, we might say. Well, St John uh, says that we must love the brethren. So if he says that, I suppose that would imply that we love, in a particular way, our fellow Catholics and all our fellow Catholics not just like the ones we like we love all our fellow Catholics of course there is a grade of friendship which we can dispose of freely and which we are allowed to withdraw from those who offend us say since we have no obligation of giving it to anyone but that does not mean that we do not pardon the offence. And it certainly does not mean that we hate him for it. We've got to distinguish between the neighbour and the enemy, the man and his sin against me, the man and his qualities. We have to separate the work of God's hands which is the man who has been redeemed, and the work of that man, his sin. Human nature is always good and cannot be hated. Sin is evil and must always be hated. 
So the sin should be hated, but not the person who commits it, and whose repentance is so desired by God. You remember that parable of the, uh, the sheep who wanders off and leaves the 99, and Christ goes to look for it. I was reading about that this week, and I read that what the sheep did, wandering off on his own and putting himself in great danger, is a great sin. What the sheep did was a great sin, it said. I thought this was a bit harsh. I mean, I don't think very often sheep overthink things. In Animal Farm, the sheep had their own Ten Commandments. Isn't that funny? They had their own Ten Commandments. And the poor sheep couldn't remember them. They were written out on the barn wall, and the sheep couldn't remember them. And the pig said, look, there's only ten, for goodness sake. Surely you can hold that in your head. And they said, oh, we're sorry, man. we can't. So the pigs invented slogans so that they could remember them and repeat them. And, and there were significant moments when there is opposition to what the pigs are doing from the other animals, and the sheep shout, drown them out. Drown them out by shouting, four legs good, two legs bad. Four legs good, two legs bad. So the sheep and their character actually suited the pigs very much. And in fact, the character of sheep suits the character of any tyrannical government. So they too invent slogans and stick them on the gantries on the M8 every 500 yards or so. Um, what do they say? Plan ahead, save lives. Plan ahead, save lives. You see it every 500 yards. Mare, say the sheep. Or Boris Johnson's got this little hands, face, space. Hands, face, space. And you're all supposed to, that's what you're supposed to keep in your head. It's, it's absolutely incredible. But sheep like it. Sheep like it. And it works. So, I don't know. At any rate, the sheep wanders off, which I suppose he doesn't think is a grave sin. He's a sheep. But, objectively, of course, it is. It is a grave sin. Because the sheep is doing what he wants and not what the shepherd told him to do. And that is pride. And that's always a grave sin. But the shepherd doesn't hate the sheep because of what he's done. The sin. He certainly hates the evils that could overtake the sheep. And so he goes looking for him because he loves the sheep. I mean, you think about the passion of our Lord. <laughs> That's not very just, is it? It's a grave injustice done to our Lord on the cross. And our Lord hates the injustice. He hates the blasphemy. He hates the sin. But he loves the sinner. For whom, actually, he died. In this we have known the charity of God, because he hath laid down his life for us. We read that in the epistle. And then, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, that's a very radical thing to say. But I think the phrase, laying down our life, doesn't necessarily mean dying for him, which we could only do once anyway. But something that we can do daily. We must not hate our neighbour. We must not deny him anything which is his by right, neither in the natural or the supernatural order, socially or humanly. He is still a man, even though our enemy, with all the rights which are attached to that state. So we must not exclude him from the collective prayers or alms deeds. 
nor from those obligations of charity, such as saving our neighbour in danger or helping him in grave need. And that's the example that St John gives today when he talks about people who have the means to help someone who is in need, but won't do it because they don't like him. How doth, the chari- how doth the charity of God abide in him, he asks, which is as much to say that it doesn't. And if we don't have the charity of God abiding in us, we are destined for hell. So that's the context of today's gospel. And that's the context, I suppose, which if we do apply the parable of the great feast, the great supper given by the Lord, um, to the Blessed Sacrament, receiving the Blessed Sacrament, or the communion, as they call it in the Protestant churches. Communion is being one with God. That's what communion is. That's why if you are one with God, you have to have integrally the Catholic faith. No good just letting all and sundry who happen to wander in the church to go up to Holy Communion. They've, they've not made a profession of faith. They've not committed themselves before the Blessed Sacrament to his service. So non-Catholics can't obviously receive Holy Communion. Public sinners can't receive Holy Communion. I mean, these people who are are forbidden Holy Communion, there was some very famous example. Uh, Joe Biden, I'm thinking of you. The the reason why the the bishops are forbidding him to receive Holy Communion is not because they're all Republican supporters or they don't particularly like him. It's because he's a public sinner. He promotes and advocates abortion and various other public sins. He promotes those things. He cannot then present himself to be one with God when he's in a state of sin. You can't do that. Anyone who has committed a mortal sin cannot receive Holy Communion. That just makes sense. If you're going to be united to the very essence of God, the nature of God, you have to be in a state of grace. So you have to be in a state of grace because you are one with God, but you also need to be one with your neighbour. And you can't receive Holy Communion if you are at enmity with your neighbour, if you hate your neighbour. In the parable, there is this curious idea that the great and the good don't want to come to the banquet for some reason. (laughs) And so the Lord of the banquet is forced to compel people to come. All sorts of people, not the people he had originally chosen. And certainly not the people we would have chosen if it were up to us, which it is not. The Lord chooses who comes to the banquet, not us. See how these Christians love one another, said a pagan back in the second century, I'm calling him a pagan. I've got an idea. It's Lucian of Samosata, but I'm not going to say that on tape (laughs) if I'm wrong. It's probably him because he wrote a lot of satirical works against the Christians who are now springing up all over the known world. He used to like make fun of them. And he said that contemptuously. See how they love one another. Because pagans, obviously, as I said, The default setting of the world is hatred. You're supposed to hate people if they're different or if they're from a different social class or they speak a different language. These things are differences, and by associating with them, you can get contaminated. Horace, the poet Horace, who was a noble Roman and wrote beautiful Latin verse with which we torture schoolboys, probably still in traditional schools. Uh, He said famously, I hate the vulgar mob and shun them. (laughs) 
Yeah, well, there you are. That's what pagans think. And I think, as I say, it's because of differences. Differences in the pagan world are to be shunned, not embraced. But Christians don't mind differences. Differences are part of our nature, and they were created thus by God. This idea that we must all be the same is not only communist, <laughs> but it's fundamentally against the mind of God. All men were created equal. Someone quoted that to me on an aeroplane once. I was travelling on an aeroplane, of course you were trapped in this tube of aluminium hurtling through the sky at a thousand miles an hour. You call it escape. So I was berated by this man telling me, oh yes, but doesn't the Bible say all men were created equal? I said, it doesn't say that. That's from the American Constitution, you know. Anna. Oh, oh. <laughs> all men are not created equal I'm clever and you're stupid obviously everyone is created different that's the way God made us he didn't make everyone equal so this uh, <laughs> this is a bit of a I think this has been going around for a long time but I think it principally came into the church uh, in the 1960s when uh, some of the French bishops, and famously, of course, Archbishop Lefebvre said, that uh, what is happening at the council is the French Revolution. The French Revolution in the church. So these principles, which sound quite nice, who wouldn't like freedom? Who wouldn't like uh, equality? Who wouldn't like brotherhood? But of course, that's not what they mean when they say liberté, égalité, fraternité. No, that's not what they mean at all. It's forcing everyone into one size fits all, which is against the nature created by God. So, if that comes into the church, you get all these funny ideas to try and make everyone. Why should it be that? The priest, only the priest who distributes Holy Communion. Why shouldn't anyone be allowed to do it? So they do. Why is it the priest who does the readings? Everyone should be able to do that. So, so they do. Why can't everyone say the Our Father at Mass together? So, they do. But that's not how you achieve unity. That's not fraternity, that's not equality. That's a foolish utopia. In fact, utopia is too good a word for it. It's a dystopia. They're all different, but that's not an obstacle to our charity. That's what feeds our charity. So we've got quite a good congregation here in Edinburgh. Uh, it is perhaps, for some of you, a bit of a shock to realise uh, that um, the people who are actually at the banquet are, for the most part, the spiritually poor, feeble, blind and lame. Because the good people didn't come. The people who were originally invited didn't come. So that's who we've got. The spiritually poor, feeble, blind and lame. But God still loves us. So let us love one another and let us worthily receive of his bounty at his heavenly banquet here that we may rejoice with him forever at the banquet in our heavenly home. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.